the context is that a friend of Jesus named Lazarus was extremely ill and some of the family came to Jesus' disciples and said, Lazarus is ill, can, we, can Jesus come and pray for him? And Jesus, for reasons that perhaps were known only to him, doesn't immediately go. He, he waits for a while. And he finally do, does make his way to the home of Lazarus, that he has just arrived when we see this, uh, when we begin our lesson. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt as, at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. See, Jesus arrived from their perspective too late. Lazarus had already passed away. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, greatly disturbed came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it, and Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man came out his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Well, some years ago, uh, in a previous church I was pastoring, we were preparing for the funeral of a former member which was to be celebrated in the sanctuary of the church uh, that Monday afternoon. And this member lived several hundred miles away and arrangements had been made for his body to be flown in and delivered to the church. What we had not counted on was that the delivery was going to be happening on Sunday afternoon rather than on Monday morning. We'd never been asked to store a body in a coffin in the church before. We had to kind of scramble to figure out what to do. But we finally came up with a plan. We didn't think a whole lot of it except for the fact that I suddenly realized Oh, Sunday night, the youth group is coming to the church. And some of them might not feel too comfortable about having a coffin and a body there in the church. And so we figured, well, what should we do? So we said, well, you know, we'll, 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 we'll store it in a, in a place that not many people go. This was a small church. There really wasn't any of those nooks and crannies that sometimes you find in a big old church where sure you could find some place where nobody was likely to go. It was not that kind of a building. But we did put it in the place we thought would be the least likely to be uh, intruded on. And then we thought, well gosh, maybe we should tell the youth leader. 
so that they can make sure that none of the kids go in that room. Because <laughs> we didn't want to tell the kids that there was a body there. We thought they'd have a hard time with that. Then I, mean, then I got to think, oh man, our youth leader, she's, she's great in a lot of ways, but boy, is she excitable. I think we would freak her out if we told her this. And so we decided we weren't going to tell anybody, and, and we hoped for the best. And that night I went to, to bed, and I started ruminating, as I sometimes do, and I, I got to think, oh man, I hope they didn't decide to play hide-and-go-seek in the church building that night. <laughs> No, no, thankfully they didn't. <laughs> and everything worked out. But, it, you know, afterwards I got to thinking, isn't it strange? Isn't it weird? Isn't it ironic that here in this building that was dedicated to the propagation of the belief that death has been swallowed up in victory, we're so freaked out about a, build, a, a, a body and a coffin in our room, in our home, in our church home, that that we better not tell anybody. It's kind of strange, isn't it? It, it? it reminds me of the woman who said, you know, uh, when somebody asked her, do you believe in life after death? And she said, oh yes, I absolutely believe that. I believe that when I die, I will go to a place of peace and joy. And... But why do you bring up such a depressing subject on a beautiful day like today? We have this weird idea about death. On one level, we say, oh yeah, we believe in, in eternal life. But boy, is it depressing to think about that. And, and, and there's some reasons for that. But, but we haven't quite gotten used to the fact that death happens. We haven't quite gotten used to the fact that every single one of us has a terminal diagnosis called life. It's going to happen, brothers and sisters. And yes, on top of that, we do believe that while we are absent from one another after we lose a loved one, that someday we will be reconnected and that because Jesus lives, we too can live. See, many of us believe in a life beyond this one, in line with what we read from Revelation 1, 7 that, that uh, Alan just read, where there will be no more hunger or thirst, and where we will be ushered into the springs of water and the water of life, and where God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. But that doesn't stop a lot of us from being pretty creeped out by death and everything that surrounds it, especially since death is that necessary door that we must go through in order to get to this wonderful place we call heaven. I, I can't speak for other cultures, but particularly for a lot of us born and raised in America, our attitude towards death might be said to go beyond mere discomfort. I, I am not the first person to comment that here in America we live in the midst of a death-denying culture. We want to pretend it doesn't going to happen. And we remove ourselves from all of the things that, that would remind us of that. Now that's a fairly new thing in our culture, but it's very real. And it's interesting because at first glance, the story that we read in the Bible this morning about the death of Lazarus might seem to be in collusion, in working together with our culture to deny the reality of death. In our story about Lazarus, we'll talk about a dead man walking. Our country's recent obsession with zombies has nothing on this story. As we read, by the time Jesus arrives on the scene, Lazarus has already been dead for four days. And when Jesus tells them to take the stone that covered the tomb away, Lazarus' family members are aghast because they know that, especially in a warm climate, bodies that have been lying inside of tombs for four days have started to stink. Yes. You can imagine them saying when Jesus said, take away the stone, Jesus, no, no, don't make us do that.
because they know what is really true. The dead is dead. This is a done deal. His body has already started to decompose. If Jesus hadn't taken his time getting there, maybe there might have been some hope for Lazarus, but not now. And yet Jesus speaks a word, and Lazarus' stinking and rigid body comes back to life, good as new. And like I said, on the surface at least, this story sure seems to lend itself to our desire to deny the reality of death. It, it, it could be and has been interpreted, this story, as saying, stick with Jesus and like Lazarus, we can evade the inevitable. We don't need to grieve if we only believe. But I don't think that that's what God, John is getting at in including the story, which, by the way, doesn't appear in the other three Gospels. After all, Lazarus' resurrection from the, from the, resurrection from the dead was, was only temporary, wasn't it? He, he died eventually. Rather, I don't believe that this is a story that John tells us to deny death. I, I don't think it's a death-denying story. Rather, I would suggest that it is a death-defying story. Far from denying the reality of death, the Christian story accepts death as a necessary part of what it means to live and to be human. But at the same time, this story defies our fears that death is the final thing, that death is the end of the story, that death has the final word about our existence. No, even the story of Lazarus is not a death-denying story. Notice what Jesus does when he arrives at Lazarus' home. He, he sees Lazarus' sisters and family gathered there to mourn their loved one. And, and look at this, he, he joins them in their mourning. He doesn't chastise them for mourning. He, he becomes part of the mourning. And when I say that Jesus mourned, I want to assure you he really mourned. In verse 3, 33, it says that Jesus was deeply moved. But the Greek word underlying this is more like Jesus shuddered with sadness. That his body shook with emotion. In fact, the, the word in classical Greek is also used to refer to a horse snorting. You ever seen a horse snort? It goes through the whole body. <coughs> and that was what was happening with Jesus. He was perturbed and greatly distressed in his whole body. And maybe you have seen this at some time, or maybe you yourself have experienced it. When you are such in deep grief or so upset about something and your body, it isn't just, you're, you're not just crying, but your whole body is shaking and shuddering. And that's what was happening to our Lord Jesus. And then it says that, that Jesus wept, or as our translation reads, Jesus began to weep. And in our antiseptic way, may we, maybe we imagine a single tear running down his face. But the Greek suggests that Jesus burst into tears. He wasn't playing, y'all. He wasn't just pretending to make Lazarus' family feel better. He was, he was shaken at the reality of death and all that that meant for Lazarus' family. And here's the thing. We need to understand that that's how Jesus walks with us in this life. That, that the understanding here that we get is of the compassion of Jesus with his, for his people, especially in our times of grief. Compassion, which literally means suffering with. Jesus suffered with them. He suffers with you and I. He not only just understands 
understands our sorrow, but he participates in our sorrow. Now, like I said, Jesus isn't playing, but here's the thing. Jesus truly grieves with Lazarus' family, even as he knows that in just a few minutes, he's going to pray. And Lazarus is going to rise up from the death. His, his reaction is the very embodiment of Paul's powerful words that remind us that as Christians, we grieve, but we do not grieve as those who have no hope. Jesus grieved. But he didn't grieve as if he didn't have any hope. He knew what was going to happen to Lazarus. He knows what's going to happen when you and I die. And he grieves with our loved ones. And he grieves with us as we are mourning the end of our lives and the end of those relationships. But he doesn't do that without hope. And that is what we are called to do. You see, and that's the interesting thing. Jesus never tells us to move on. <laughs> he never says, oh, you're, you're, you're taking too long to get over the death of your loved ones. He never says that. And, 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 and he, he wants us to be free to fall into our grief. I'll say a little bit more about that later. But he wants us to be free to open ourselves to the depth of those human emotions. God gave those emotions to us for a reason. There's nothing faithless about grief. In fact, faith at its best actually allows us to feel our grief, grief more deeply than if we were not held by our faith. Without faith, there is the temptation to hold back, to avoid the deepest and hardest feelings for fear of being swallowed up by them and the enormity of it all. But if we experience God as our partner, as being present and suffering with us, we can face death. And our grief, head on, with less fear and lowly. Some years ago, I, I read a, a wonderful book called Here If You Need Me. It was written by a woman named Kate Graystrom, who is a pastor. But the story uh, that she tells in this book happens before she became a pastor. And it really talks, or, or begins at least, before she became a pastor. And it, and it talks about how she responded to and, and dealt with the death, the sudden death of her husband. Her husband was a, a main state trooper and, and he was killed in the line of duty. He was involved in an accident and it just happened like that. And she was devastated and her family was devastated and, and she began to try to deal with it. in a way that embodied the faith that she had. And the scene from the book that most stayed with me comes in the immediate aftermath of her husband's death. For, for a variety of reasons, Ms. Bracegirt makes the decision that she wants to be the one to tend to her husband's body rather than allowing the funeral home to do it. She tells the funeral director that she's, this is what she's going to do and and, and, and that tells them they don't need to do anything. She will clean and dress her husband's body in preparation for the funeral. And the, the funeral director reluctantly agrees to let her do this. But when her friends and, and her husband's fellow state troopers learn of her plan, they try to talk her out of it. This will be too much for you. When they realize that she was not to be dissuaded, a few of them offer to accompany her to the funeral home and help her with the task and she accepts their help. The description of, of Ms. Braystrup's tending to her husband's broken, dead body is both excruciating and lovely, all at the same time. It is first and foremost a profoundly tender act of love but it is also, I would contend, the exact sort of response that I am calling death defying. It is based on the trust that with God's help and the help of her family and loved ones, she can and will get through this horrible loss and that she can do the things 
that her heart is telling her she needs to do, as heartbreaking, as difficult as they are, in order to honor the love that she and her husband share. And the love of God that sustains them. She can even immerse herself in, in the worst that death can do and the trust that love is stronger than death. Her love for her husband, to be sure, but also God's love. It is a faith that in the economy of God, full-blown, heart-rending grief can be both harrowing and healing. All at the same time. Harrowing and healing. A number of years ago, I, I, as some of you know, I had a long connection with Camp Wanakee, one of our uh, conferences, summer camping programs. And, and a number of years ago, I was invited to go to get some training for some programs that they were wanting to introduce to the campers. And, and one of the things that I was introduced to was something called a trust fall. Is anybody familiar with a trust? what a trust fall is? The trust fall, I'll, I'll explain it to you. The trust fall is that somebody stands on an edge, and it would have to be higher than this for it to truly be a trust fall. And then they're told to turn around away from the edge. And then there's a group of folks, usually eight or ten of them, and they line up on two sides. And Al, if you can come here, you're going to be my demonstrator for this. And what they do is they line up on two lines, and they face each other, and then they put their arms out just like this, a little bit further down the aisle. And then they brace themselves. And so they're interwoven each other, and they create a, a, something for the person who's going to fall backwards from this edge of a table or whatever. And, and it works. I've done this, and I survived. But I can tell you that when you're standing there on the edge and you're not supposed to turn around and if you keep turning around, sometimes they even put a blindfold around you to keep you from looking. You are going to fall back blind. And you have to trust that those people are ready to catch you. And if they're doing their job, they are. It's kind of like that with faith. And with grief. Some of you know what I mean when you say that you're, when you're in grief, you kind of stand at this edge. And you feel like if you just let yourself go, you're just going to keep falling. That the sadness will eat you up. And then you won't get through it. But you also know that on some level you need to go through that. You can't keep pushing this away or it'll lead up inside from other, some other way. Maybe, maybe this being All Saints Day or maybe because I'm talking about this, maybe, maybe some feelings have been stirred up inside of you. That's all right. It's all right, but, but maybe, and maybe, maybe, you're not sure if even today you want to fall into that. Well, I'm around all these people. What, would I do? what if I start blubbering? What if I start crying and I can't stop? When you go through this trust fall, at least the way I was taught to do it, when you're standing there with your back to your friends, hopefully your friends, <laughs> And you're ready, you think you're ready to fall. And you can stay as long as you want on the edge there when you're in the trust fall. They aren't going to push you. They're not going to force you to go sooner than when you're ready. But if you feel like you're ready, you say to those people, falling. And how they let you know that they're ready, that they're standing there, that they're braced. As they say, fall away. God is saying always, but especially here, fall away. Fall away. Fall away. I'll catch you. 
there's something stronger than your grief. You can fall into.